Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. And today we actually have a special guest, which is Rahul Pandey, who was a former Stanford student and also founding member of a startup and now works at Facebook as a software engineer. And today we're actually going to talk about and ask him some questions about big tech, about Fang, how you can get into Fang and what's actually important to know there. So welcome Rahul, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hopefully, some of the things I'll say will be helpful for many of your, a lot of for your sure. audience, and <laughs> happy to follow up as well with any other questions. We often hear of this dream of working in a fan company after after the degree, you know, usually good working conditions. And now you, as someone who works in such a company, what would you say to people who actually who have the goal of working in a big tech company? What are the skills they, they really need to know, they really need to have before they apply to such a company? It's an interesting question because I feel like the skills you need in order to apply and get an interview and the skills you need to succeed on the job are actually quite distinct. I think you're mm -hmm. asking more about that first category, which is how do you, yes. what do you recommend so to people? When are, are you ready to apply? When are you ready to apply? And maybe like, what are the, skills to actually succeed in that process right so yes. i feel like um there's a couple things first off i think that if you're messaging a recruiter from fang and you are getting a callback like you're they're saying hey we're interested in your profile can you interview then you're in a much better position because you have a lot of control over how you do the interview prep which is mostly focused on data, st data structures and algorithms which we can talk about but if you're not getting that callback you're not getting the engagement from the recruiter, then I think your goal has to be to figure out how to stand out in your resume or in your profile such that you can actually get called back, uh, get called back um, at some point in the future. And the number one lever that you have there, I think, is to do a side project. Build an app, publish it, and actually get a meaningful number of users on it. Uh, that is very impressive because you're essentially building a product, you're sticking with it over a long period of time, and you're showing to people that the thing that you created, it has value to people. And that mm -hmm. is the true marker of a good engineer. So I feel like that's probably one big lever. The other thing, if you're into that is open source. So if you want to do, if you can show people that, Hey, I have done a bunch of open source commits to this really well-known repository, um, especially if it's owned by that company. Like for example, if you work at, you know, um, Facebook, if you want to work at Facebook and you do an open source commit to React Native or React. That is, I think, really impressive. And the third thing I'll say, which is less in your control, which is just, just to get more experience. So let's say that you're not getting reach outs right now from Fang, but you are working at a software development company right now, like a medium sized. If you just keep working there and you do good work, then typically you're going to find that you're going to get much more reach outs if you're senior. So if you keep mm -hmm. getting promoted at your company, you will eventually start to get um, engagement from recruiters. Okay. And how would you actually um, say how much is social media in, uh, plays a role there? You just mentioned a lot of um, like building projects, having experience. Would you say having a popular social media audience would also be a great way to actually help getting a job at Fang? I feel like for the most part, the answer is no, mm -hmm. unless you have a very large following, which is focused on that topic in particular. So like what I mean to say is that if you have like a couple thousand subscribers on Instagram and like most of your photos are about you going out and getting coffee and, you know, living your life. And then occasionally <laughs> you have some content about Android, that's mm -hmm. not really <clears throat> moving the needle at all. Like you need to have a dedicated channel or dedicated account, which is focused mm -hmm. on Android to show people that, Hey, I'm like a domain expert in this. And you also need to have enough of a following that proves that you are doing it for a long period of time and people are get are finding value from it, right? So it's not something that you do kind of on the side, um, like every fifth or 10th post. So it has to be a committed long-term thing. So really so I focus think like, on one niche as well. Yeah, like there has to be a focus on a particular domain mm -hmm. rather than like, here's my personal account and occasionally I'm posting some Android content. That mm -hmm. doesn't really help you that much. You have to have like a concerted effort to build a brand in that domain. Okay, cool. So. Now let's, let's take someone who actually went through this um, application process and got accepted. Congrats, you're now at a, at a big tech company. Yeah. Now I can, I think there are a lot of things that are actually 
totally new to you if you're just graduated maybe in terms of, of um, uh, skills regarding development um, you will probably know that what would you say are these things that are just typically overwhelming juniors there and that also decide if you will succeed in such a company yeah that's a great question and i feel like people are so focused on getting into big tech that sometimes they forget about the actual skills which they're going to need to exercise every single day in order to actually do well in big tech right and so i think it kind of comes down to two things that people don't think about enough number one is dealing with version control right so like you're a youtuber where you make a bunch of content on like tutorials on youtube and i, I did the same thing so a lot of people i know will like basically follow the tutorials that we make and they'll do it locally and then they'll be like okay i I, uh, I finished it and they post a screenshot and send it to my friends or family or whatever, right? But they don't actually have a deep understanding of Git or Mercurial or these other version control systems. And that becomes essential to getting anything done at a big company. Um, like almost everything is focused on uh, being able to check out a different branch or you know, making some quick hack on another branch, sending it out for feedback and then applying that feedback back to your main branch. Like there's so many things that you have to be really comfortable with doing in order to be productive in big tech. So that's number one. Um, and the second big thing is code review. A lot of people, when they're preparing for their interviews or when they're trying to like build out a really uh, impressive project, they're doing it completely in isolation, right? Just like they're mm -hmm. spending eight hours a day on their own using Stack Overflow to like try and figure things out. But the thing is that in, big, in uh, a big tech company, you will guaranteed work with other people to get things done. A lot of your impact will actually be delivered through other people in terms of how you give feedback to them and how you receive feedback from them. And so another big part of it, which I think people don't realize is uh, code review. And there's a skill to code review. How do you give feedback? How do you suggest a different architecture? How do you suggest a different uh, you know, way of doing things um, in a way that is still considering the other person and like not like being too aggressive about like hating their code but also being able to give constructive feedback and also vice versa you're going to be able to receive feedback mm -hmm. and act upon the feedback that you're given so i feel like those are the two things version control and code review that i don't think get talked about enough okay if we if we take these two things how would you say how can a person who wants to work at such a company actually improve on these things because for example in my experience if you just have your personal side projects um, well, you probably will know Git, you, you know how to do commits, push to GitHub and stuff like that. Uh, but very often we get comfortable and we just do everything on the master branch or stuff yeah. like that. How would you actually um, learn these concepts of Git and that you need in such a company? I would recommend try to emulate the environment of a team as much as possible, even if you're not in a big tech company, right? So, and, and you can create that environment by working with other people. So find a classmate or find a coworker and say, hey, we're gonna work on this thing together. And let's try and actually do the workflow of one of these big companies, which, which means that instead of pushing directly to the main line or master, I'm gonna actually make a code review, put it on another branch and send a pull request on GitHub. And then before I merge that pull request, but like I need someone to actually review that uh, and give me feedback. And then I incorporate that feedback and push another version of that pull request and then merge it in. And so if you kind of, it'll slow you down quite a bit initially. So I'll acknowledge mm -hmm. that, that it, it will take some getting used to. But once you get in the habit of that, you'll actually start to wonder like, oh, I feel like I was doing so many dangerous things. I was taking a lot of shortcuts, which I shouldn't have taken earlier because you're, you're going to start to see the value of, you know, getting another pair of eyes on your code. Okay, cool. So just just find some people you can work together with on a project. And how do you see the um, the role of open source? Can you also learn that with open source in a nice way? Yeah, open source is also really powerful as a way to do this. But I will say that the learning curve for open source is much, much higher. Mm -hmm. um, the people who typically work on open source are phenomenal engineers. Like they've been doing this for a very long time. And obviously they like typically if you're going to try and merge something into an open source project, it'll be reviewed by the maintainers of that project. And they are people yes. who typically know everything about it, right? They, they're the ones who kind mm -hmm. of designed it. And so I would say that open source is definitely a really good way to do this, but it's not for the faint of heart. Like you need to really commit to understanding the project, understanding the 
uh, architecture, the pros and cons of different approaches and justifying what change you've made and why you've made it. And that could take literally, I've seen some pull requests on open source projects go back and forth for weeks or even months. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, just, I think open source is great, but don't go into it with the expectation that you'll be able to move as quickly as on your own project. Okay, well, one last question that I'm actually kind of interested in is regarding the, the code reviews. So I'm someone who, who never really worked in a, in a software company. So I have no idea of this workflow. But what I've heard is that at least in, in big tech, you are just going from one code review to another code review to another code review. And that this often takes a much bigger portion of your time than writing the actual code. Is that true? I think so. I think that's pretty accurate. Um, like what happens at these companies is that there's so much inherent value in the code that's already there, right? Oftentimes the code that you have written is powering a multi-million dollar or maybe even a multi-billion dollar business. And so the priority shifts from being able to write a bunch of code to maintaining the code that you already have. Like reading the code mm -hmm. becomes way, way more important than writing new code. And so that's why there's a lot of kind of defense mechanisms in place to make sure that you protect the value, which is already in the code base, which has already been working for months or years. And you have to really justify kind of like that open source discussion that we were talking about. You have to kind of justify why the change you're making is delivering, uh, is, is worthwhile of being merged in. So I feel like, um, especially as you become more senior and you get more context about the code base and you get more context about like the good and bad parts about uh, what you're trying to achieve. I would say the majority of your job, like you said, becomes more about code review rather than writing code. Because a lot of the impact that you're going to have is actually making sure other people on the team write better code. Um, and that's actually a higher leverage activity compared to writing your own code. Okay, cool. So I will definitely link down your YouTube channel here, which you also have. I think I haven't mentioned that. You're just doing a lot of collaborations just like this, just general development videos. Do you have anything to add here? The one thing I'll add is my friend and I, we run a community called Tech Career Growth, which is mm -hmm. actually focused on exactly the kind of topic that we talked about here, which is mm -hmm. I want to get into tech or I want to accelerate my career in tech. What are the skills I need? What are the, who are the people I need to know? in order to make that happen. And so if people are interested, I will send you a link and maybe you can include it in the description yeah, as I will, well. I will just include it down here. So do check it out. And yeah, thanks for your time, Rahul. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is super fun.